Welcome, welcome, patrons. There have been a lot of media tie-ins in the world of Dragon Age. Books, movies, web games, comics, etc., etc. But not all of them have been... good. A lot of the content produced early on in the series' development has been sort of swept under the rug and forgotten about. One of these is a six-issue comic, referred to by fans as the IDW Comics, named after the publishing company, as the comics themselves are just labeled as Dragon Age. What makes the series so perplexing, minus the terrible understanding of the world's mechanics and lack of plot, is that it was written by Orson Scott Card and Aaron Johnston, of all things. So yes, the guy who wrote Ender's Game wrote for Dragon Age, and it sucked. <laughs> Aaron Johnson also seems to work with Card a lot as well. In a brief Google, it seems that a majority, if not all, of his work was with Orson Scott Card, but let's get to the authors later and go over what happens in the comics. Issue 1. First, let's just touch on the cover a bit, mostly just to say that this woman right here is just a weirdly colored Morrigan, and that's just really weird. I'll get to more in that a bit, sort of. That's all I really wanted to say on the cover. Anyway, we have no idea when this is set, but it seems to be set around the time of Dragon Age Origins. I'm going to assume at the very least it is in the Dragon Age. We open to Kinlock Hold, the Ferelden Circle Tower, with a bunch of young mages learning about fire from an enchanter. A young girl named Vaness seems to have a gift for it. We cut to years later, a Templar named Sadat is training and being called a girl for not fighting well enough. The man he was fighting with states that he hates losing and tosses him off a cliff. The very wet Sadat swims to where an older looking Vaness is keeping a fire going. Despite the obvious resentment he has for mages, the two exchange pleasantries and he refuses to let Vaness hate him. Vaness is then in the library with what seems to be a friend. He is worried that she might be sleeping with the Templar, worried that if they are caught, things could get bad, although Vanessa claims she isn't. We cut to... Gregor? Briefing a newly caught mage on what it means to live in the Circle. When he breaks free and begins to work blood magic, someone calls for Sadat to kill him, but he freezes, leading another Templar to kill him. Vanessa watches from the distance. Sadat and Vanessa are now somewhere in the circle, and it looks like they have been sleeping together. But Sadat regrets his choices and flees from his lover. In the kitchens, Vanessa and her friend are complaining about how he left, and she thought he loved her, and her friend replies that he can't because he's a Templar. Sadat seems to watch from a distance, and we will learn later that this is the moment he thinks that these two are sleeping together, where like, that's not what I got from the sequence, but whatever. Eight months later, Vanessa is pregnant, and the Templars have caught it. This Templar, who might be Gregor, although it doesn't look like him, asks who the father is. When she refuses to tell, he smacks her. Templars are now bringing in apprentices, meaning that everyone here is like at best 18, but whatever, to find who the father is using a spell, which, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that. When the father draws near, the smoke surrounds them. When Sadat happens to bring in the friend, who we find is named Abernath for the first time, the smoke surrounds them both, and the Templar now believes that Abernath is the father. Abernath is now in a meeting with Gregor, who tells him that if given the chance, he would kill them all, but if he confesses now that the child is his, he won't kill him or Vanessa or the child, and so the child will have to go to the Chantry to be raised. Abernath approaches Vanessa, asking her to confirm that he is the father, as it will save the life of both her and Sadat, but he also loves her. Cause that, I don't know. But she doesn't want to give up the child, so she runs off. And she somehow escapes, I guess? They, they don't... Th that's the most interesting part here. I want to know how she <laughs> escapes. But anyway, uh, the Templars have a meeting telling Sadat that he is to be the one who hunt her down and kill her. Vanessa give birth to the child alone in the woods. She's able to catch a merchant wagon and gives him the baby, a daughter she has named Gleam. The man asks if he can help her, but she refuses, telling them to ride on. And again, just pausing for a moment, this man looks nothing like the father she has later on, so I have no idea who this guy is or how Gleam got to her family, but anyway. We cut to the circle tower to see... <sighs> A darkspawn? A herlock, I guess, climbing and sneaking its way in. The herlock finds its way to Gregor and attempts to murder him. 
a voice speaking out that it is being controlled by blood magic by someone called the Man of Light who wants to take revenge for all of his brethren that Gregor has killed. I, I don't know. But then suddenly, two armored Templars and not Morrigan bust in, killing the mind control spawn. One of the Templars dies in the process. This is the last time we see any of these people and also not Morrigan, so tough shit if you want to know who they were, because I sure don't. We jump to Vanessa, who is being confronted by Sadat. He asks where the child is, and she replies that it's dead. Sadat says that the child wasn't his, he knows it was Abernath, and that she was cheating on him, and honestly, it's just so obvious what happened here, but whatever. She replies that nothing happened between her and Abernath, and the child was Sadat's all along, and then he kills her. Great! Issue 2! Seventeen years later, Gleam is living with her adopted family, the father being a blacksmith. The father complains that he and her brothers need to get back to the forge, and we see her making a sword using her magic. A sharp sword that cuts metal. We get introduced to a younger brother and a cousin, Agmo and Datlin. The Templars come in then, asking about the magic sword that was just created, and the father lies and said that he won it from a dwarf. Cool. Uh, the Templars ask if the blacksmith can fix the horseshoe, and he tells his older son, Ormo, to fix the shoe and Gleam go back into the house for safety. Before she leaves, the Templars explain that they are bringing back a boy who can move stones with his mind. When she yells for them to leave the boy alone, her father slaps her, asking for forgiveness of the Templars and saying that she has hired help and needs to be trained. Later, he apologizes for hitting her, saying that he needed the men to believe him. Gleam falls asleep and is in the fade. She meets a spirit of... <sighs> Venom? A spirit of Venom. A spirit that calls itself Venom. Okay, but in her life, it was her mother, Vanessa. She has stayed here in the Fade to help warn her daughter. People are going to try and manipulate her. Templars and perhaps something else. A rage demon controlled by probably the Man of Light comes in to attack Gleam as she wakes up at her mother's urging. A new day and Gleam thanks her dad for making her a hilt for the sword she made. He sends her off with Agmo and Datlin to go trade with some dwarves. Now in Orzammar, probably dust down. I don't know how they got in, but at this point, I'm not asking questions. <laughs> They're trying to trade for dwarven ore. The dwarves make an offer for about half of the ore they want, to which Datlin brags that they have a sword that can cut through metal, showing the piece of a horseshoe that was cut in half. Gleam makes the final offer of three-fourths of the ore, and the dwarf agrees. On the way back, Gleam and Argmo are angry at Datlin for bragging because it could have gotten them killed. We cut to the dwarf, who is letting another dwarf named Minderel, Minderel, I'm gonna say Minderel, who only has one arm to go follow them and find the sword. If it's real, capture Gleam. If she refuses, go tell the Templars that a mage is on the loose. We cut again to Gleam's house. It's raining, and a group of thugs approaches Gleam's family. They intend to rob them. Back to Gleam and company, they spot smoke coming from the farmhouse. Once they get there, they find their family dead, with tracks heading south, and off Gleam goes to follow them. Issue 3. Except not yet, because they bury their dead. In fact, they don't actually go after the thugs at all. We're just going to completely forget about that. Anyway, uh, the kids argue over what to do now. They decide that perhaps they should go to Datlin's parents in Guerin, but can't decide on how to get there. And here we see the dwarf hiding in some bushes. Uh, they end up catching a rabbit to eat, it rains, they fall asleep, and when they wake up the next morning, their mule is gone and they find it with the dwarf. Gleam recognizes him and realizes that he has been following them. The dwarf kicks Gatlin, and Gleam threatens him with fire, giving the dwarf the advantage, as now he knows that for sure she's a mage. The dwarf asks her to make another sword, as the other was stolen. She says no and walks off. They soon stumble onto a town having a fair. Datlin enters a boxing contest for money and gets the shit beaten out of them by some random kid. Gleam steps into the middle to stop it and Datlin whines that his nose is broken and that he should heal it. And she just does? In the middle of a crowd? Even though she knows it's a bad idea? I don't know who would have guessed. It turns out to be a bad idea, but whatever. We cut back to their camp and she heals the tooth back into his mouth while telling him that he's an idiot for losing all their ore on a stupid bet. And we cut to someone tallying on Gleam and word arriving at the circle. Abernath and Sudat, who I swear to God, changed his name to duty after he killed Vaness. I can't... I can't handle this. I can't handle this. Why would you sit so stupid? 
The two argue about what Sadat did and that he has to capture the mage and not kill him. Great. Uh, we cut to Gleam who is walking through a jungle, I guess, and finds a bandit camp of blood mages. Who knows Gleam is a mage, somehow. The leader greets them and sets up a protective ward using blood around the camp. Turns out they all worship the old gods. And Ferelden. Gleam then finds something of her family and threatens to kill them all. Issue 4. The main blood mage guy, whose name we still don't know and we will never know, throws off Gleam, saying that he is a friend, and that he just bought the kettle. He didn't steal it. How convenient. And then he just lectures her about how blood should be spilt in service to old gods and freely given, and it's not that violent, blah blah blah. He heals her wounds, lets her know that he has somehow dampened her powers for now, and they just leave. Or they try to. Blood Mage Dude asks her to train her and she, you know, that she could do good service to the Man of Light, but they refuse and he gives them cloaks and they leave. We cut back to Sadat. I am just refusing to call this man duty here. And he's just touching the ground, I guess. And this random cloaked person, who we never find out who this is, by the way, is describing Gleam, saying that she looks just like Sadat. Sadat and his friend Marcus are talking about killing mages and how he used to be called Sadat. But look, guys, not once has this man been called duty yet. Not once. He just keeps correcting people. <laughs> We dump to Gleam in Barrington, which is not an actual city we know of, so it was just made for this, so I don't believe it exists. And they're trying to sell the mule they have. Datlin announces to the crowd that anyone should fight him, and if they win, they have the mule. If they lose, he gets 10 coins of, of something. A thug rushes in, and Agmo hits him with the stick, and he's knived. Okay. Great. Way to go, Datlin. Gleam then heals him in the middle of the road instead of dragging him off somewhere. How is she still not in the circle? How? Has she- I just- I can't with this. Agmo is healed, but shockingly, people are upset and hit Gleam. Gleam wakes up, the three of them all tied up around some pole thing. The town wants to talk, which is surprisingly civil, but she starts a fire blazing and she frees herself and the boys, with the fire so large the Templars nearby see. Gleam and the others are running into the woods knowing the Templars are near, and they come across the one-armed dwarf. He warns that Templars can track the blood that is on them, somehow, and the dwarf gets him to follow them. They go wash up from the river, and Minderell, which he never introduces himself to Gleam and the boys, but they now just know his name, hears someone coming, and it's the Templars. Gleam finds out that her powers are not working, and they start running from their lives. Dallin picks up a sword to fight off the Templars, and Sadat runs him through. Gleam begs for them to give her powers back so she can save him, but tough shit, he dies. That's it. No, honestly, he actually dies. There's no, like, bait and switch here. Issue 5. Gleam calls Sadat a murderer, saying that he was just a boy, and they let Gleam and Agmo bury him. Gleam tells Agmo that he should go to Gwerin and find Datlin's family to live with them. Agmo wants to escape, but Gleam tells him that she has no powers and isn't going to try because she doesn't want to lose him. Sadat comes in with them with food and asks them about their parents, telling him that he will send word that they are safe. Both of them explain that their parents are dead and Gleam is adoptive, which is why she looks nothing like her brother. Gleam is then asleep and back in the fade. Her mother is back. She actually uses the name Duty and says that his name is actually Sadat and that he is her. And she wakes up uh, to the one-armed man rescuing them and takes them away far enough so that her powers work again and she lights a torch. We cut to the Templars. They are up, and they go after Gleam and company. Stat orders her to be taken back alive, which is surprising to his men, which is concerning, honestly. Minderell takes him into a cave, leaning into the deep rose. He tries to open a gate when Gleam is grabbed by the leg by a Templar and uses her magic to escape. Why did they suddenly not have the, the dampening power? W okay. <laughs> and they all run through the gate, leaving the Templars behind. Now they are in the deep rose, but don't worry, there are no darkspawn here. Because this, this place, guys, is the last true roads. Yes, really, no darkspawn here, just true roads. They ask why Minderal is saving them, to which he reports that he's still trying to get her to be a smith. Agma wonders if they should, because it's just a lot safer when he is hit with the web. It's a giant spider. She burns it to death. 
Mindril was bitten by the spider and asked her to heal the venom in his leg. And he also describes how to heal him with magic, which I don't know how a dwarf would know anything about working magic, but okay, so she does it. And then he teaches her how to set his broken leg so she can heal him, which she does. He passes out. And then she, ah, oh, she heals him so hard. He has his other arm back. His arm is back. Except it's tiny and, and silly looking. I, <sighs> okay. Mindril thinks it's cool. He has an arm now that he can grip with stuff and they keep on moving. Then hours later, they are moving through the cavern. They find an entrance to the surface and then they find the people that killed their parents. How convenient. Isn't that great? Issue six. The thugs hint that the dwarf brought them down to molest the children. Great joke, great joke, perfect joke. Thank you, Orson Scott Card. <laughs> um, Gleam starts to make magic fire happen and another mage in the group fights. Minderell jumps on her neck and threatens to kill the other mage. Minderell gets knocked out. The leader women uses a sword that Gleam made and now Gleam is mad because now she actually knows they killed their parents. Great. The thugs explain that they killed her parents. The fight breaks out. Gleam isn't able to win, but the group says that they want to take her to the man of light as they might get a reward. Except the Templars are back. Great, they defeat the thugs and now have Gleam and Argmo back. Apparently Argmo, when all this was happening, ran and found the Templars while the group was fighting. So they went all of that way in the deep roads and they like weren't even that far from the Templars. Sadat crushes the magic dampening crystal. Okay, and let's Gleam heal herself. Oh great, now he, oh thank you. Thank you. Now, now she gets to heal herself. Now it's important. Okay. We cut to the Templars hanging the thugs. Uh, Agmo wants to know which one killed their parents. The leader admits to it and Agmo gets the honors, I guess, of slapping the horses to run away. And we get a loving embrace of siblings close to a bunch of corpses. Later, literally, it, it just says later, even though it looks like the exact same scene, Marcus is telling Sadat that Gleen ran from Templar custody and therefore is an apostate and needs to be killed because that's the law. The law is to kill apostates. That's not the law. Sadat, <laughs> Sadat refuses and when Marcus states that she assaulted the Templars in their sleep, Mineral comes back from somewhere saying that he was the one who did it. Sadat then makes the decision to take the dwarf and the boy back to the circle to meet the knight commander. We jump to the circle tower. They want to kill the dwarf for his crimes, but they decide they won't because relations with the dwarves are strained. But they decide to make him work in the circle instead. And the boy will work in the kitchens instead of going back to his family, I guess. They, they're not taking him prisoner, they're just keeping him there, whatever. Gleam will stay in the circle and will be trained as she seems to be a great asset. We are in the fate again. This time Gleam is with Sadat and Vanessa introduces her to her father. Gleam is upset. Sadat tries to make amends, but Gleam says that he will never be her real dad. He then begs Vanessa to kill him because he is shamed. Vanessa questions why he named himself Duty and he decides that his new duty will be Gleam. The next morning, Sadat confronts Gleam on the news that her brother will work in the kitchens and that she needs to stay here for her safety because the man of light is trouble. He leaves saying that he will wear out his life to give her a future, and she believes it. The end. Discussion. I just... I don't... I don't know where to begin here. I honestly... It, it would be much shorter to say what is good about this than what is bad. I just... It's, it's just really bad. Like, I know I'm, like, making fun of it and stuff, but, like, I just can't... It, it's it's so boring that my only reaction to this is just confusion and frustration. Like, it's not... I'm not... It, which, maybe it's one of those so bad as good comics. Maybe you're into that. Is that like a... Like, they have that with movies. Maybe they have that with comics. I don't know. But this is just... This is an event. G getting down to it, I guess my main complaint here is that this just isn't Dragon Age. I don't know which of these two authors I need to blame for this. I know people are more inclined to blame Orson Scott Card, which we'll get to that in a second, but whatever meeting went down to explain the world of Thetis to them just didn't stick, or maybe it didn't even happen. I don't know. It's like they already had a story in mind and just slapped on some words to make it vaguely fit. Honestly, I, I don't even think they had a story in mind. I think they just, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what they did. I don't know how this came about. Like, I complained about the Dragon Age tabletop game and how it feels a bit different from the series, but it's still Dragon Age. It's still Dragon Age. I'm not gonna dispute that. In fact, 
I've read really bad fan fiction that has a better grasp on the world than this thing does. But to stop with the humor for a bit, why isn't this Dragon Age? Why does this feel so completely different than anything else in the series? At its core, Dragon Age is about people. It's about the emotional responses of people who have been through a lot. The story of this comic fails to understand this. Instead, it throws the characters at a constant stream of tragedy and negative events, and we never have time to explore their pain, grief, fears, or just anything interesting. This mainly doesn't feel like a Dragon Age tie-in because it has none of the heart behind it. Even if they didn't mishandle the world building, it could have at least felt like it belonged. And it just misses every mark. Another reason why this doesn't feel like Dragon Age to me, everyone is so stupid. Everyone. There are just so many parts where I had to like astral project my soul into another dimension to even handle how dumb this was. It just, oh God, for the, for the most part in the Dragon Age series, even the dumb things that some people do have some logical sense to them. When even if things, when, even, with, even when people didn't make the right choice, you can still see the logical, pro fuck, the logical progression of thoughts. Just how that person came to that conclusion. Here there is none of that. It's just action. Stupid, stupid action. Now I gave snarky comments and odd words screen remarks to how things were incorrect here and here lore-wise, but let's discuss some of the things that just really bothered me. The Templars were never this cruel in Origins. The Ferelta Templars were fairly mild. Like, they're not great, but they're mild. Now if this was Kirkwall, okay, now we're talking. Take this line. Magic is a sin of pride. No, like, like it's literally nothing to do with pride. The Maker was never offended by magic. He was offended by the fact that they worship spirits and broke into the Fade. He was offended on how magic was used. N not, not magic is pride. I just, I just, it, what does that even mean? Honestly, what does that mean? <laughs> The Templars here treat the word apostate to mean a death sentence. And even in the world of Thetis, it's not great, but it's not automatic. It's not a law to kill them like it's implied here. And the way Templar abilities work is just so different. A crystal to stop magic, they can just track anyone's blood? No, no, god. The ability to stop magic is a result of them taking lyrium. It's not an item's effect. It's it's them doing it because they had to ingest this substance. And tracking blood that's limit, limited to only phylacteries, which can only be made by mages. And then there is just no way, there is absolutely no way, that this is the same Gregor in Origins. Not only do they look different, but I refuse to believe that Dragon Age Origin Gregor, who it's hinted at being the father of Wind's son and wanted to run away with her, would do the things that he did in this comic. It just, it just doesn't make sense. Like, Gregor could be an ass, but he's not slapping a pregnant woman and wanting to kill all the mages he sees an ass. Like, he's fairly decent. He's a decent guy. Another thing, Sadat's appearance just it doesn't make sense. He looks like Sten, which would make him a hornless canary, which is super duper rare, but he is never mentioned as being a canary anywhere at all. And humans aren't known to have white hair. Nowhere does a human in Thetis have white hair as a young person. Whoever wrote this just looked at Sten and thought, well, guess that works. And then there's the names. They just sound so, so fake. Agmo, Datlin, Lomo, even Gleam sounds odd. This. The one, this one I just can't place why it's so odd, but many of the names for people are just so awe-sounding to the world of Thetis that we know. And also, no one tells you their names. No one tells each other their names. It's just known. It's just suddenly they know each other's names. It, it, this is really picky, and I don't know why it bothers me as much as it does. Something unrelated to the Dragon Age lore, or really the plot of the comic that you might have noticed, is that after a few issues, the art style just changes. A lot. Honestly, I, I kind of welcome the change, not that the first style was bad, it just... It, it was so inconsistent between the panels, it was really hard for me to just decipher who was who and who I was looking at at any moment in time. The new style was much more clear and consistent. Even though, in this new one, and this is perhaps something about comics in general, but remember, Gleam is 17 years old. This is a 17 year old girl. Look at those pants! 
So, yeah, after this series ended, what happened? Well, um, a lot of people theorized that there was going to be another issue, as the covers would often hint at what would happen in the future, and it shows her fighting off a golem, which obviously never happened. However, what, what did happen to make this series stop? They slapped a giant the end on it, and so the mystery of who the man Light is, which I'm taking bets is this guy, the blood mage guy, because that would just be the stupid answer. All of these will never be found out. Why this was shut down is unknown. I would guess it's something related to bad sales, but who knows. I've seen some more recent fan speculation that it could have ended because of Orson Scott Card himself. If you're unaware, Card has been against same-sex mari same marriage for some time, and as that is something that is obviously against Bioware's beliefs, it would make sense that they would distance, him, distance themselves away from him. Except that that was actually known before the comics were published. There Apparently there was a pretty big outcry when they found out Orson Scott Card was going to be writing these comics. Perhaps Bioware didn't know at the time, perhaps the deal was even made without them thanks to EA. Uh, we really don't know. Either way, I think we can all agree we're glad it's over. I will say that um, I, I have not actually seen this and I don't think there's any clips of it, maybe there are, but I got a tweet from Octoflora, he's really good about uh, like a lot of the more nitpicky stuff that I miss sometimes. Apparently he was watching a stream with um, Mike Laidlaw because he does streaming, and someone actually brought up these comics and Laidlaw says that they were not happy. Now I might get some of you asking, is this canon or not? No, this, there is no way that this is canon. <laughs> I could not imagine any other universe where Bioware is just constantly running from this nightmare of a comic. Not only does it not make sense, it breaks a bunch of the world lore, but it was written by Orson Scott Card. Like, I've already talked about that scenario. Like, the Bioware is running away from this comic and it never wants to look back. This, they would prefer that everyone forgot about this, and honestly, I think we should. There is nothing of merit here. I, I think the only thing that might be interesting to some people is that a dude with one arm got his arm back, because that could possibly happen to the Inquisitor, and it, honestly, I don't think the Inquisitor's getting their arm back. I think that takes a lot of the impactful situation of losing the arm, but that's another thing. But if if for some reason you're writing a fanfic or something, and you want an in-lore explanation of getting your arm back, I guess you can have a random mystical girl named Gleam who, by the time of Inquisition, she'd probably be like in her 30s. That's not too bad. Anyway, an overly sexualized 30-year-old woman um, <laughs> healing you because healing you so hard that your arm grows back. And that, your patrons, is all that we know of easily the worst Dragon Age comic and perhaps tie-in ever. Um, do you still have lingering questions? Proofs that I'm wrong? Comments about your own fan theory? Feel free to tweet me at, at Gilderthon on Twitter or send a PM to user Gilanon on Reddit. Dresh your roll.